Okay, welcome everybody to uh, another edition of Squash Canada's Coach PD webinar series. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Kenzie Osborne back with us again today for part two of her performance nutrition uh, series. Today's topic, all gains and no pains of performance nutrition. Um, she's going to get into some of the intricacies with respect to, you know, learning about the nutrients required for muscular growth and repair, uh, simple nutrition strategies to fast track your recovery, and uh, much more. I'll let Kenzie get into all of that great details and introduce herself. Um, just a couple of quick notes. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to type them in the chat, and I will certainly try to facilitate uh, and or, uh, you know, certainly put your hand up and uh, unmute and with a small group, but uh, don't hesitate to, uh, you know, interject a question as we're going along and Kenzie is happy to answer or save it all to the end and we could do it uh, all at one time. So uh, we hope you enjoy today's presentation and uh, take it away, Kenzie. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right. So hello and welcome, everybody. I see some familiar faces from last time, um, or familiar names, at least. Uh, if you were not here for our first uh, session of this series, it was Fundamentals of Nutrition for Young Athletes. Don't worry. Uh, you don't need to know any of that knowledge for this one. It is independent, uh, and it's a little bit of an extension. So we'll dive a little deeper into specific strategies for muscular growth and repair. Um, as Jeffrey said, if you do have any questions as we go along, please do let me know. I'll do my best to answer questions uh, as they come in the chat. There's also going to be about a 10 to 15 minute period at the end of this session so that you can ask your questions uh, as we go along. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you were here last time, you're familiar with Menti. Um, so this is a platform that I like to use. It will allow us to ask questions anonymously at the end, as well as answer some questions during the session. So if you want to go ahead, uh, if you have your phone or if you have a if you're on a computer and can open another tab, uh, you can either go to menti.com and enter in that code or scan the QR code. Once you're in, just give the uh, tap the like button so that I know you're in. If you can't do that, that's okay. You can participate and uh, ask any questions in the chat on Zoom. If you want to ask me any anonymous questions, just privately message me in Zoom. And again, I'll do my best to, to get to all of those. Um, as a small introduction, if you weren't here before, uh, my name is Kenzie Osborne. I'm a former NCAA tennis player. All of my brothers were uh, high performance squash players uh, competing in the worlds for Canada and now coaching some teams in the States. I am a natural nutrition clinical practitioner, a chef, and a recipe developer. Uh, so I develop recipes for high performance athletes and help them incorporate nutrition strategies in ways that are practical for a crazy athlete's lifestyle. Um, so that is my area of expertise. And I will get things started. If you haven't yet logged into Menti, you can do so throughout the presentation. The top banner will always stay there so you can log in. Okay. So to kick things off, uh, what kind of foods come to mind when you think of a muscle building meal? So if you're trying to gain muscle mass, what are some foods or some meals that may come to mind? Again, you can respond through Menti or on the Zoom chat. There are no wrong answers here. We'll be talking about this uh, throughout the sessions. If you have any ideas of what may be, I guess, facilitate muscular growth. If we have no ideas, I'll move on. Chicken, spinach, aka Popeye. Chicken's great. Spinach would not necessarily be awesome in facilitating muscular growth, but chicken for sure. Chicken has a lot of protein in it, uh, which will help with muscular growth. Spinach is a lot of fiber, not a lot of calories, not a lot of energy. So it's not really going to help build our body. It's very nutritious. It's just not really going to help us um, build muscle per se. Okay. Um, so 
We're going to first talk about the stages of building muscle. Now, I did go over this in my last session, so this may sound like a review, um, but we'll go through it again just uh, to, to recap how this works. So when we are building muscle, the first thing that will happen is we will do some sort of activity that challenges our muscles and actually damages them in a certain way. So your muscle fibers are, uh, they, they will form small micro tears when they are worked. Okay, so if you imagine um, my hands as a as a muscle fiber here, you will see a very, very small micro tear in that muscle. And that occurs when we're completing hard work. Uh, if we're on the squash court doing lots of lunges, uh, if we're doing weight training, anything with resistance is going to put stress on our muscles. Once those muscle fibers are damaged, our body needs to do a couple things to repair that damage. So during rest and with adequate fuel, your body's going to be able to repair that damage. Once it's repaired, we're going to kind of fill in that uh, damaged, you know, muscle tear. And we're going to begin to build a stronger muscle so that next time we have to put more stress on our muscles to tear it, to damage it, to build it again. And that's how muscular growth occurs and how we continue to build muscle. Okay. So to build your, to build muscle, your body needs three things. It needs energy. So the form of energy that we use in terms of food is called calories. That's simply just a measure of energy that goes into our body. Protein. These are the building blocks of our body. They're the building blocks of our muscle and then rest. So your body needs time to rest to rebuild muscle, to recover. If we just constantly, you know, put stress on our muscles, we're going to get injured. So our body isn't going to have time to recover and repair that damaged muscle tissue. And we will end up injuring ourselves. So we need all these three things in order to adequately recover and build more muscle. Okay. So step one, we're going to start with looking at energy. So how can you get energy from food to help you maximize muscle growth? So out of these options, which food would provide you with the quickest energy for your body to use? So which one will be able to be used and processed, processed the fastest? So you have banana, chicken breast, or peanut butter. Again, put your answers onto Menti or into the chat, or if you're really not sure, then either take a stab at it or just hold on and I'll explain. So you have banana, two votes for banana. Okay. So it is banana. Um, so after the reason for banana is banana is a simple carbohydrate. So if we have these three options, we have banana as a carbohydrate, we have chicken breast, which is primarily protein, and we have peanut butter, which is primarily fat. Protein will be the hardest for our body to use as actual energy. Fat will be our second source, but carbohydrates are always our first source, especially simple carbohydrates. So ones that are higher in sugar, a little bit lower in fiber, easy to digest, those are ones where we're going to use energy uh, the fastest, okay? So after our exercise, we need these simple carbohydrates like a banana to be able to quickly get energy into our bodies. Through training, we lose what is called glycogen stores in our muscles. And this is essentially our sugar stores in our muscles, those are used, they're depleted, and we need to replenish them so that our body has sugars, has energy to be able to complete its normal functions. So after training, we need simple carbohydrates to use as fast energy. Then we need protein to come in and rebuild. So they're kind of like the construction workers of our body. They're going to help reconstruct our body uh, and our muscles. And then we need enough calories. So just purely enough energy going back to into our body so that we have all the energy we need to keep our blood pumping, to keep our um, blood flowing, heart functioning properly, brain functioning properly. All of that needs enough energy. And because during training, we've expended a lot of energy, we're going to need a lot of energy to come back in. 
So has anyone heard of the time window show of hands, this uh, lovely 20 minute time? Has, that, has anyone heard that you need to eat within 20 to half an hour after a workout? Just a little show of hands on the on Zoom. Has anyone heard of that before? A couple people have heard of that. Okay. So this was a belief. Um, and it's not necessarily, it's not necessary. Okay. So it's not a bad idea to eat after a workout. Uh, it helps you to be able to get enough energy in without eating a massive meal. So it helps you sort of have a little bit after your training and then have a little bit an hour later and then a little bit a few hours later. Um, so it's not a bad idea, but it's not necessary. There's not this half an hour time window where your body decides to use energy. And then after that time window, you just don't use that protein or carbohydrates. Um, in reality, your body is recovering for 24 hours. So it's actually important to make sure that through those 24 hours or on a regular basis, you are having a healthy diet that is comprised of protein, carbohydrates, and fats not necessarily just chugging a protein shake after your workout and calling it a day. So in terms of the studies, we're looking at have a good meal about three hours after your workout. So within that three hour time period, but again, it's not super important. So first priority should be to build a all around healthy diet Second priority may be to incorporate some nutrient timing, but really the studies don't show too much promising evidence as to if I have a protein shake within 20 minutes, I'm going to be a lot stronger than if I have it an hour after. Okay. In other words, you don't have to be running out of the squash court to go and get your protein shake. You can take your time. Okay. So we're going to start talking a little bit about carbohydrates, right? So as I mentioned before, uh, you need simple carbohydrates that are quick to digest. This is important before and after training. Okay. At all other times you can enjoy those higher fiber foods. So, uh, whole grains, uh, beans, legumes, um, things like, uh, fibers, vegetables, but actually between that time period, so a little bit before and after your training, you really want carbohydrates that are quick to digest. You don't really want to be throwing something at your body that's going to take time and energy for you to digest, right? So if you're eating beans, your body is working hard to digest that food. Whereas if you eat a banana, it's pretty quick, pretty easy. You just get the energy. Your body doesn't have to do much to actually use that energy. So before and after training, we don't want to expend a lot of energy. So we're eating foods that are easy for us to digest. It's going to be bananas, honey, uh, maple syrup, fruits, things like that. Okay. These simple carbs, the use for them is they're going to replenish those sugar stores in our muscles. So the storage form of sugar in our muscles is called glycogen. That is how it is stored. Those carbs are then also going to be used to repair any other, to, to help facilitate repair any other damage that's in our body, help us to return to our regular daily functions, okay? So help our brain get back to normal, help our um, blood flow go back to normal, help everything just recover from that training session. So as I said, some of those simple carbs, bananas, fruit juices, sweeteners, uh, starches, so things like white rice, uh, potatoes, pasta, things like that. You're not really going to want that brown rice. You're not really going to want those heavy beans after immediately after a workout. Uh, great foods to have after that training period. But again, within that training period, we want things that are simple, easy to digest. Okay. So what's your favorite simple carbohydrate to have after a meal or after training? Sorry. Any favorite carbohydrates here? I'd have to say mine is banana. I don't know. I love, um, for some reason, I love lightly salted banana slices. The sweet, I like sweet and salty stuff and uh, it's really good. <laughs> Any other thoughts here? Or I guess, what would you typically eat after training that would be high in carbohydrates? 
apple and chocolate. So this is a great one. So apple, fantastic. That is a great carbohydrate. Um, chocolate, which is 80% is actually a fat. So that's primarily fat content. So not something um, super great to have right after training, because again, we don't want something that is going to slow digestion and fats do slow digestion. However, 80% dark chocolate, great source of uh, magnesium in there and really good for outside of the training window. Orange juice, is that a decent fruit juice? So for the vast majority of people, I would not necessarily recommend fruit juices because they are quite high in sugar. Um, however, for athletes, athletes are a little bit different than, um, than the average person. So any sort of fruit juice I would say is okay. Again, within that training window, probably about a cup is more than enough of what you would need and try and look for ones that don't have any added sugars in it. So some of them you'll find an orange juice, but it'll have a lot of added sugars in it. Um, you would want to just have one that, you know, when you look at the ingredient label, it's just saying oranges. And uh, again, a cup or so of that is, is absolutely fine. Uh, banana, mushy ripe or firm. You don't really want a green banana. So the more green it is, the more starchy it is. And the more starchy it is, uh, we then have to convert that to sugars in our body. So it's a little extra of a process. So I would go for more ripe bananas. Yeah. What are common fast carbohydrates? Uh, so yes, the fast carbohydrates as here. So that's bananas, fruit juices, honey, maple syrup, other sorts of fruits, um, potatoes, not the best one, but it could be one, uh, rice, pasta. So starches are not super ideal, but they, they still can provide your body with relatively easy energy. Uh, the most ideal is, is primarily fruits and sweeteners. Can you tell fast carbohydrates from an ingredient label? Um, you can, so you'd be looking at something that has natural is, is primarily made with natural ingredients. So if you're looking at the ingredient label, you want to primarily be looking for fruits, um, maybe honey, maple, maybe maple syrup. And you would want something that's relatively low in fiber content. So you don't want something with a ton of fiber in it. The more fiber, the harder it is for us to digest. Again, I am stressing this is only between that training kind of period, right? Uh, outside of that, you want fibrous foods. But for, for the purpose of after training, you want quicker. So uh, in terms of ingredient label, you won't really see a lot of fat. You won't see a lot of uh, protein necessarily. Uh, you'll probably just see higher carbohydrates, lower fiber, and you want to make sure that it's, uh, you know, ingredients that you can pronounce. So fruits, honey, maple syrup, maybe some rice, things like that. Okay. Great question. All right. So step two. So now that we have our simple carbohydrates in our bodies uh, working its magic, we want step two of getting your protein in. Okay. So how much protein do most people need after a workout for maximal muscle growth? Any ideas for numbers here? Throw out a number. Twelve grams, okay. Fifty grams, all right. Any other guesses here? We have twelve and we have fifty. Is anyone gonna go for it in the middle of that? <laughs> no, okay. So we are looking for about 20 to 40 grams per meal. Um, and af that includes after a workout. Okay. Now these numbers, the, uh, I'll explain why there is the reason between 20 and 40 grams. The primary reason is just, it's going to depend on whether you are male or female, um, what age you are, how active you are, how tall you are, what your weight is how uh, well you digest protein. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. In general, we're looking at 20 to 40 grams. 
Now, the average person does digest about 10 grams of, of protein per hour, so can actually use about 10 grams of protein per hour. If we have 50, 60 grams of protein in one meal, we may not actually be able to use all of that protein. Okay, so it's better to have smaller amounts of protein throughout the day rather than have a ton of protein all at once. OK, um, again, 20 to 40 grams per meal. You may be saying, how do I decide what's right for me? Well, these uh, I'll, I'll explain some recommendations on the next slide. OK, in terms of what this may look like. So if you're thinking, how do I get 25, sorry, 20 grams of protein in my diet without using protein powders? This looks like about one cup of Greek yogurt, a half of a cup of chicken breast, one cup of tofu, a half to one scoop of protein powder if you are using it, it just depends on the brand, and then about three quarters cup of cottage cheese. So it's not, even though 20 grams of protein may sound like a lot, it's not a lot in terms of food quantity, okay? That's relatively simple to get into your diet. Uh, you know, a cup of Greek yogurt in a smoothie with some berries and honey, there, you got a perfect after workout snack, okay? Um, now, in terms of knowing, is it 20 grams or is it 40 grams for me? These are the recommendations from a couple different organizations or associations around the world, okay? So for daily protein intake, the World Health Organization for the average not athlete person is 0 0.83 grams per kilogram per day, um, okay? So if you are 100 kilograms, then you would eat uh, 83 grams of protein in that day. Again, this is for non-active people. The Dietitians of Canada, along with a couple other sports associations within Canada and the US, recommend 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram per day for physically active people. So people who uh, identify as being physically active, that may mean they are working out for 40 to 45 minutes a day, for an hour a day maybe, okay? Keep in mind, this is not necessarily for athletes, this is for physically active people. The International Society of Sports Nutrition recommends just a little bit higher at 1.4 to two grams per kilogram per day. And there are some other recommendations uh, based on different independent studies that go as high as about 2.4 grams per kilogram per day. Now it's important if you are eating high, um, high concentrations of protein in your diet that you do speak with your doctor. So excess protein intake can damage the kidneys. Okay. It can also um, have other implications on your body and your health. So I would say anything, if you are eating two grams per kilogram per day or higher, it's highly advised to talk to a nutrition or sorry, to a, um, a doctor or your primary healthcare provider before proceeding with doing that. Um, for athletes who are trying to lose weight, Okay, so if they are in their quote unquote cutting phase, if they are trying to lose body fat, um, they may need increased protein needs in order to limit their muscle loss. So when you are in a what's called a catabolic state, when you are losing weight, you are going to lose fat and you are also going to lose muscle mass you can't really pick one or the other. If we could, that would be great, but you can't do that. You're gonna lose a little bit of both. So uh, if you are an athlete and you are working on losing weight, um, in likelihood, you will need to increase your protein intake to try to not lose as much muscle. So to really try and maintain the current muscle mass that you do have. Uh, so some independent studies go from anywhere from two grams to three grams per kilogram per day. Again, anything above two grams per kilogram per day should be talked to uh, with a doctor before proceeding. Okay, so these are the different daily protein intake recommendations based on body weight for people who are uh, of a bit higher physical activity or who are athletes. All right. Okay. All right. So what types of protein should you be having? Okay, so what type of protein is best? This is a question I get asked a lot, uh, and there is an answer to it. So 
the protein digestibility and corrected amino acid uh, effectiveness score, which is a really long name, uh, helps us determine what proteins are best for humans. So there's a few different factors for this. So there's the biological value, which is basically how efficiently our body can use the protein. So does our body use it easily or does our body have to break other things down in order to use that protein in an effective way? Okay, so the best protein from a biological value standpoint is eggs. We tend to use eggs the most uh, efficiency, efficiently in our body. Okay, the second factor that is uh, within this calculation is the effectiveness for animal growth. So this is called the protein efficiency ratio. And the best for this is casein protein. And that's at about two point, the, the rate for that is 2.7. Um, now this is primarily done in rat studies. So in terms of how it can best be used in humans, the studies are kind of lacking here, but in terms of how effective uh, a protein is at promoting animal growth, promoting that uh, protein synthesis, the muscular growth that we're looking for, casein tends to be the best one. And casein is one of the proteins that is found in milk. Now, out of, you know, when you factor in both of these, these factors, you do get a protein score. And the top protein scores are casein, which is a component of milk, whey, which is a component of milk, then of course you have milk, <laughs> um, egg and soy protein. Okay. So those are kind of at the top closely followed are beef and chicken. Uh, and then you have your more plant-based sources. So things like quinoa, uh, black beans, other types of beans, things like that. Um, I do get a question a lot of times is animal protein better or is plant protein better? Again, studies are limited. What we do know is that in order to uh, have the same effects when eating plant-based protein in comparison to animal is you will have to eat a variety of plant-based protein sources. So when we look at proteins, when we look at their biological value and their efficiency ratio, we want to make sure they have all of the amino acids that we cannot produce in our body. Okay, so there are nine amino acids. Amino acids are simply building blocks of proteins. Okay, so they're like little Lego pieces that make up a protein. We need nine of those to survive as a human being. Okay, we need those nine from food because we can't synthesize them ourselves in our body. We can make 11 of them in our body. So there's a total of 20. We can make 11 of them in our body, but we cannot make the other nine, which means we need it from our diet. Animal proteins contain all nine of those amino acids. Plant proteins, with the exception of soy and quinoa, okay, other plant proteins do not contain all nine, which means you need to pair different sources of plant proteins in order to get all of those amino acids, okay? If you do that, and you do that properly, so you are getting all those amino acids, and you're getting enough protein in your diet, then plant and animal proteins are about the same, okay? So think of it, it's a little bit harder to get in all those plant proteins because you have to pair different foods together and you may have to eat a little bit more protein in terms of grams, just because it's harder for our body to digest and use that protein. But if you do that, and you're eating plant-based diet, you may have the exact same muscular growth um, results as somebody eating a, a diet uh, with animal proteins would, would experience, okay? So although it may be a little bit harder, it's definitely doable in terms of eating those plant proteins. So after all that talk about protein, what would your favorite proteins be? So you could go with some dairy products, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, milk, you could go with animals, so fish, chicken, beef. Um, you could go with plant-based, so tofu, tempeh, edamame, those are all soy, uh, quinoa, beans. Those all have proteins in them. What are your favorite proteins? 
cottage teas. So cottage teas for everybody out there is very high in casein protein. Uh, and casein is one of the ones that does tend to be the best for animal growth, so for muscular growth. Turkey, fish, awesome. Baked beans. So yeah, beans uh, can be a good source of protein. Keep in mind for beans, look at the nutrition label, okay? Um, a half a cup of beans, some of them may have about six grams of protein, which isn't a lot at all. And others may have closer to, you know, 12 for a serving. So just take a look at that. Um, but it does contain protein for sure. Hemp, hemp seed. Okay, so hemp seed is quite high in fats, which is, it's a great source of very healthy fats. In terms of protein, the amount of hemp seeds you would have to eat to get enough protein uh, is a little bit absurd. So I wouldn't necessarily consider hemp seeds as a protein source. Do they contain protein? Absolutely, they contain protein. Um, are they a great source of a primary protein? Not necessarily. So they are more so a fat source than they are a protein source. And again, if you were eating those as your main protein, you would have to eat a lot of hemp seeds. Uh, chicken, yeah, chicken's a great one, of course. All right. Okay, so step three. So we've talked about carbohydrate, making sure you're getting your energy needs in there. We've talked about protein, what kinds of protein, how much protein we need. Now we're talking about rest. Again, if you don't rest, you're just gonna continue to put stress on a damaged muscle, which is going to likely um, uh, either result in soreness, injury, uh, anything like that. Okay. So we need to make sure that we're resting. Now on average, it takes our body 24 to 48 hours to fully recover, which is why in most personal training split programs, you'll see, uh, two days between training the same muscle group. So you may see legs on Monday and then you won't see them again till Wednesday or Thursday. So they'll, they'll give you enough time to recover that 24 to 48 hours. Rest is when that muscular growth happens. So like I say, during training, your muscles get damaged. They don't grow during training. It's during rest and recovery that the muscles actually grow. And if you don't allow that rest and recovery to happen, you're not going to get muscular growth. As I said earlier, daily eating habits. This is why they're so important and even more so important than specific nutrient timing. It's much more important to make sure that during those 24 to 48 hours, you're eating high quality proteins, fats, carbohydrates to be able to fuel your body properly than running out of your gym to get a protein shake within those 20 minutes. It's a lot more important just having those consistent healthy eating patterns. In addition to that, there's something called anabolic state and catabolic state, okay? Uh, when we are building muscle, we need to be in an anabolic state. An anabolic state simply means that we are eating more calories than what we're expending. A catabolic state is the opposite. We are expending more energy than we are consuming. If we want weight loss, we want to be in a catabolic state. We want to be expending more energy than what we're taking in. This will result in us losing weight. It will also result in us losing a bit of muscle mass, losing some fat mass. Okay. So if an athlete is trying to lose weight, they will need to be in a catabolic state. Okay. An anabolic state, that is where we are consuming more than what we're expending. This allows us to get bigger to grow our muscles. Uh, we may also gain a little bit of fat during this time. So we will get bigger in that anabolic state because we're basically putting more onto us than we are using, right? Now, whether you're in anabolic or catabolic state, whether you're eating more than you uh, expend or less than you expend, the general recommendation is to not exceed a pound of weight gain or weight loss per week. OK, if we're doing that, we can be going into some dangerous territory. Uh, we are basically changing too much of our body for our body to adequately adapt. So whether you are losing or gaining weight, 
no more than a pound. If you are trying to lose or gain weight, it's really important you're working one on one with a health professional to do that and to monitor that process. Okay. So during this rest, just as a, as a quick little summary here, you need to rest in order to uh, gain muscle. It's more important that during that rest time, you're eating a healthy diet than specific nutrient timing. And if we are working on gaining muscle, it's important to be in an anabolic state and not exceeding gaining one pound per week. Okay. So again, to summarize the overall steps to muscular growth here, we need simple carbohydrates and protein after our workout. We need adequate rest and we need to be in that anabolic state with constant nutrition maintenance. That's kind of, if I was to write a formula for muscular growth, this would be the formula. So why not just go to McDonald's and have chicken fingers and fries, right? You got fat, you got a little bit of fat, you got some protein with the chicken, uh, you got your carbs with, uh, with the potatoes in there. So why not, why is, you know, McDonald's chicken fingers and fries maybe not the best option? So the effects of fast food or lower quality foods after training, here's what happens. Lower quality foods, so are typically higher in fat, particularly those uh, saturated fats, that slows down digestion. So we can't use that energy as quickly or in the same way as with whole foods, all right? Chemicals and additives can be dangerous to overall health. So the various different ingredients that are used in fast food uh, chains can be dangerous to yeah, you know, our digestive system. They can be uh, potentially carcinogenic and they can have other health effects. And what I like to think of is what you eat after your workout is fuel for your next workout. If you wouldn't eat a burger and fries before your workout, you probably shouldn't be eating it after your workouts. Okay, so post-workout food is fuel for your next workout. The higher quality that you can provide your, your body with, the more quality your body can actually grow. So you can, you know, optimize your muscular growth, optimize uh, how much your performance is improving and really support your health in the best way. So even though, a, and this goes for all food products, not just McDonald's, um, not just fast food, it goes for also protein bars, um, processed foods at the store. Really try to fuel your body with whole foods. Whole foods in general are the easiest for our body to digest and utilize. Uh, and you'll get your best bang for the buck with that, uh, which is why I almost always promote having natural sources of protein before turning to protein powders. Yes, you can use protein powders. Uh, it is convenient. But if you can have more whole foods more often, generally going to be better for your nutrition. So we have talked about carbs. We've talked about proteins, but what about fat? So is fat necessary for muscular growth? And a short answer, yes, it is. Okay. So as I said before, muscular growth occurs in that anabolic state. So when we're eating more calories than we're expending, of the three macronutrients, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, fats are the most nutrient dense. They provide us with the most calories per gram. So if our body just needs energy, we use fat as a source of energy in our body, then it's going to be easier to meet those energy needs with fat than, you know, eating a ton of carbs or protein, right? Um, in terms of gram amount, you would have to eat double the amount of carbohydrates as fats to reach the same energy um, uh, totals, right? So, you know, I'm not suggesting that you go and eat a jar of peanut butter, but incorporating those fats is going to help you reach your, uh, your calorie goals for the day, which for athletes can be quite high. Secondly, fats help produce hormones. So they actually help in the production of certain growth hormones, and they help us absorb vitamins uh, that are essential for muscular growth. Okay. So they do help us absorb uh, different vitamins and vitamins in our body, 
And they do help us produce those hormones uh, that are important, including uh, certain sexual hormones as well, which is going to help with our growth and development, especially for young athletes. The type of fat does matter. Okay, so it is, uh, there, there have been studies that suggest that saturated fats really don't help with muscular growth, uh, or really any sort of muscular function in our body. However, there's some really interesting studies that say that polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats may actually help protein synthesis. So may actually help us build muscle. And the interesting one here is particularly with omega-3s. Okay. So there are some studies that have found that people who eat more omega-3s in their diet notice higher rates of muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so there's something happening there where omega-3 fatty acids can actually support your body in building more muscle. It's also seen that people who eat a little bit more omega-3s in their diet have a decrease in muscular breakdown. Okay, so if you are in that catabolic state, um, you may be able to offset some of that muscular breakdown with more omega-3s. They aren't super sure on how this, you know, works from a biological standpoint, but this is what is noticed in various studies. Okay, so specific reasoning remains unknown, but these are some of the outcomes that they are noticing with higher intake of omega-3s. What foods have omega-3s? Those are going to be your fatty fish, so salmon, mackerel, uh, sardines, herring, anything like that. Uh, flax seeds, walnuts, and soybeans. So things like edamame. All right. So those are the foods that tend to be higher in those omega threes uh, and may be beneficial to helping promote that protein synthesis. All right. So we have come to the end of today's uh, workshop or presentation. I'm going to leave it open right now for a few questions. So again, you can either type your question through Mentee, or you can just use the Zoom chat to type in your question. If you want to ask a question from an anonymous standpoint, but you're not on Mentee, just type it into the chat and I will, uh, I'll get that for you. All right. While we are thinking of our questions, I am going to just post a quick link to a feedback form um, that you can fill out after this session, which will help me to make these workshops uh, the most beneficial and useful for you. So I'm just going to pop that into the uh, chat. Do you provide one-on-one -on -one counseling? I absolutely do. Yes. Um, so I do provide counseling. I will put my email. Uh, it's on the next slide, but I'll put the email in the chat as well. So you can reach out to me directly for one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling services. They are covered by some insurance companies as well. Um, so depending if you do have an insurance plan or a health spending account, they may be covered. Um, but I do provide one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, for, for athletes. Yes. Um, also on the form, it, uh, the form does have a question on it. If you would like to do one-on-one -on -one counseling, then, um, I can, I will reach out to you if you fill out that form. What about vitamin supplements? That's a great question. So for, in my personal practice, I don't necessarily recommend, um, supplementations as a primary, uh, like a, as a first resort, I will only recommend a supplement if there really seems to be something that is missing from your diet. So if you are vegan, if you are vegetarian, um, if you have another condition that inhibits you from consuming a certain type of food and you are actually missing out on a vitamin or mineral from a diet. If you have a well-balanced diet, you can get all the vitamins and minerals you need and omega-3s from the, those food sources. Some people may suggest uh, something like fish oil or cod liver oil for omega-3s. Again, personally, I will try and get this through food first. And then if there is some benefit, I may look into uh, getting the, you know, the, the cod liver oil or the fish oil to be able to supplement those omega-3s if it's hard for you to get it, say if you don't eat fish. 
um, then it may be, well, I guess if you don't eat fish, you can't have fish oil anyways. <laughs> but um, if there's something there that's inhibiting you from getting that omega-3, then I may, you know, suggest that. However, like I say, every vitamin, every mineral can be consumed through the diet. And as long as there is no uh, other external I guess, a uh, thing that is inhibiting you from having a well-balanced diet, then I'll usually go to, to, to what can we do to incorporate those foods before looking at supplements. Um, if there are any supplements that are, you know, started one common one, I guess there is one common one that I do recommend, which is vitamin D primarily just because in Canada, uh, vitamin D comes from sunlight and half the year we don't get a lot of exposure to sunlight. So vitamin D is one that I do tend to recommend. However, with any introduction of a supplement, I like to double check with a doctor to make sure that your specific, any health conditions that are going on specifically, uh, there's no interference with a vitamin or mineral that you're supplementing. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful with vitamin and mineral supplements because you can uh, over consume some of them. So uh, it's always recommended before you start any supplement that you're talking with your doctor. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, again, the ones that I would go to would be cod liver oil, fish oil, um, uh, sometimes magnesium for recovery, um, vitamin D. And then apart from those uh, protein powders would be considered a supplement. And before implementing any of those, I always go to a client's doctor first to, uh, to double check for any interactions there. Awesome. Any other questions today about this session, about last session, um, about something about nutrition in general? <laughs> If not, I will just quickly go to the next slide. Um, okay. So if you are looking for more support, there are one-on-one -on -one sessions, as I said, that are available. Uh, if you go to the form that I posted in the chat, you'll be able to do that um, and request for me to reach out to you. Um, there is also my email if you want to send a direct email with a request or with any questions from this session. Uh, you can also book nutrition workshops for your team. So if you do have a team that you are coaching, um, the nutrition workshops can be booked for you. And uh, if you do take time to, it's like a five minute form to fill out that feedback survey, it will, uh, it does really help in making these the most uh, beneficial for you. Uh, finally here, we do have a couple special deals for you. Uh, so we do have some partnerships with True Local, which is a meat delivery service in the Toronto area. We do also have a magnesium discount code. So if you are somebody who needs excess magnesium for whatever reason, we do have discounts on those. Um, and we do also have a discount on Fit um, at Fitted Out, which is a gym equipment store. So for all of those, it's just RX Recourse. For the True Local, it's RX Recourse Fit. Um, and you're more than welcome to use any of those to help you get, uh, get some of the things that you may need. Does, liv does liver provide any energy? Sorry, are you referring to um, like cod, cod liver oil? or um, Jersey, do you wanna just, if you can either unmute or uh, reply in the chat, are you referring to like liver meat or cod liver oil? The he human liver. So are you asking if your liver can just provide yourself with energy, like with energy? Okay. Um, so your liver is involved in the processing of fat um, and it, it won't really provide your body with energy. Um, if you can't eat bananas, any fruit will work. Any honey maple syrup will also work. Anything that has a little bit higher sugar content. So again, fruits, honey, maple syrup, those are the simplest. Um, your liver, what that does is it helps your body process 
fats, right? Um, and fats can be used for energy, but they're a lot harder for us to use as energy. So we don't really like using fats for energy. We will use it if we are, you know, in a, you know, in a 60 minute match and we've run out of carbohydrates to use, we'll start, basically there's a process within our body that converts fats to sugar. And then we use that sugar as energy. Okay. Um, our liver specifically will not provide us with energy. If it is providing us with energy, it's not a good sign because that means your body's starting to break down organs to use energy. Um, and that would be in a case of very severe starvation. So your, your liver, no, does not provide uh, any energy. We only really get energy from food and from fat stores within our body. After that, we'll start breaking down muscles, start breaking down organs. But again, that is really when we're in severe starvation mode. Um, what magnesium compound? There's usually, I mean, so in terms of magnesium uh, for, for muscle stiffness, there, there's a couple on the market that you can just that, that you can buy. Most magnesium uh, supplements will be just a uh, a more diverse, you know, arrangement of, uh, of magnesium types. Um, there's not really one that's best. They all serve different purposes. And if I were to start with a magnesium supplement, um, I would first go to food, as I said. So lots of dark leafy greens, put some spinach in your smoothie, uh, eat a little bit of kale, dark chocolate is also good. So I would go to the food sources first. If you are supplementing, again, with magnesium, super important. You talk to your doctor first um, so that that's, that is safe for you to use. But most supplements on the market will just be a combination of different types of magnesium. Yeah, no problem. Those are some great questions. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kenzie. Yeah. Uh, uh, just looking at the time and in an interest of time, uh, I think if anyone has any additional questions, you can absolutely uh, email Kenzie uh, through her contact information, or you can certainly email me and I can forward it on to Kenzie, uh, either works. Um, I guess really at this point on behalf of Squash Canada, thank you, Kenzie, again, for a fabulous presentation. Um, we look forward to having you back on uh, November 30th for uh, part three. Uh, and I encourage uh, those on the webinar today, if you haven't already, to register for uh, the, the final installment pre-game time uh, of performance nutrition. Uh, it's going to be a fabulous presentation. And then uh, going forward after this uh, three-part series, uh, if you haven't looked yet, uh, we have added uh, a nice list of uh, webinars between now and uh, the end of February. Uh, some of the topics uh, include female athletes' health, uh, developing a mindful practice, mindfulness practice, uh, safe sport, and then also what's so different about coaching uh, athletes with respect to masters uh, sport. So uh, give those topics some consideration and we encourage you to register. Other than that, uh, uh, for those certified coaches, we'll uh, get this entered in the N2SP database uh, later today and you'll get your PD point. And then the recording and the slides will be sent in the next 24 hours. Uh, and then again, uh, if you have questions, let Kenzie and I know. Uh, otherwise, thank you for attending, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future Squash Canada Coach PD webinar. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Thanks, Kenzie. <laughs>